Good evening to everybody. So today we are going to uh, see regarding thoracic lumbar fractures. So what is the function of the spinal column? So what are the important structures which give stability to the spinal column? And what are the different classifications that we are having? And how to take a decision whether to operate or not to operate based on the classification systems. So one of the very important topics, not only for your exams but also for the practical purpose. So when you see the structure of the spinal column, the spinal column extends from the, the spinal column extends from the base of the uh, skull and extends up to the sacrum. So this spinal column may consist of vertebral body anteriorly, posterior arch posteriorly, and with intervening disc space. So the main purpose of this vertebral column is to protect the soft spinal cord. So the main purpose of spinal column is to, first is to protect the spinal cord, second it is to uh, make the human being stand straight. So only human being can stand straight, all others are, uh, they are quadruples. So the, the main function of spinal column is, one is to protect the neural structure, second is to make the patient, make the human being stand straight. So when you, when you take a closer look into the structure of the spinal column, you can see here, is not only the vertebral bodies, the bony structures give stability, but the, post, the ligaments which are present anteriorly and posteriorly are very important structures in giving stability to the spinal column. So you can see here, this is the vertebral body anteriorly situated, this is the spinal column, so this is the facet joint, this is the spinous process. Spinous process. So, anterior to the vertebral body, we have an anterior longitudinal ligament. Posterior to the uh, posterior to the vertebral body, we have a posterior longitudinal ligament. So, in between the facet, we have got a facet joint capsule. In between the spinous process, we have got interspinous ligament. Posterior to the spinous process, we have got supraspinous ligament. And here, uh, uh, just at the posterior part of the spinal canal, we have got a ligamentum flavor. So I repeat, these ligamentous structures are very, very important for the stability of the spine, starting from anterior longitudinal ligament, posterior longitudinal ligament, facet joint capsule, ligamentum flavor, interspinous ligament, and supraspinous ligament. So, this anterior longitudinal ligament, posterior longitudinal ligament play a very uh, little role. Why interspinous, supraspinous, ligament of plyo, passive joint capsule plays a very important role. So when you, when you see a vertebral uh, body, 
into the vertebral body, we can relate this vertebral body to a triangle. Okay. So anteriorly we have got a vertebral body, posteriorly we have got a vertebral arch. So this is the spinal canal. So an intact, so an intact bangle is a stable one. Can you see this? This bangle we can call it as a stable structure because it will not move in all directions. It's a stable structure. What happens if there is a fracture in the bangle? For example, there is a fracture in two places. What happens? The two pieces moves away. It is this is unstable. Can you get it? If the bangle gets fractured at two places, the two part of the bangles moves further away. It's unstable. If the bangle is fractured only at one side, for example, this is a bangle, there is fracture or it is broken only at one side, still we can call it as a stable structure. So this is just to give an idea regarding what we call it as unstable fracture or stable fracture. So this is a round leg, ring leg structure. The ring is fractured on, on both two sides. It is an unstable structure. It is fractured only on one side. It is a stable structure. So just to give an outline. Okay. Coming to the uh, structure of the thoracolumbar spine. Thoracolumbar spine can be divided into three uh, parts. First part is T1 to T8 level. So T1 to T8 level, this T1 to T8 level is attached to the rib cage. Okay, that is little kyphosis is there. It is a rigid structure. The movement occurring at T1 to T8 level is very, very less. It is a rigid structure. And usually the most common injury pattern occurring here is flexion injury. So forward flexion type of injury occurs at the T1 to T8 level. Next comes the thoracolumbar junction. What is thoracolumbar junction? From T9 to L2. So what is the, what is specific about this thoracolumbar junction? We also read in uh, infection, tubercular spine infection is more common in thoracolumbar junction. Why? Because relate, this oxbothoracic segment is relatively rigid, immobile. So slowly it is coming to a mobile segment. So this is junction of immobile segment and mobile segment. So a lot of movement occurs here. So most number of injuries occurs at the thoracolumbar junction between T9 to L2. Okay, thoracolumbar junction is the most common level of uh, tubercular spine. Thoracolumbar junction is the most common level for spine injury because it is a junction of rigid spine and mobile spine. Whenever there is a junction between rigid spine and mobile spine, the chance of injury is high. Second comes to lumbar spine, L3 to sacrum. So usually it is mobile and there is a lordosis. So axial load injuries are there. Act, what is axial load injury? Axial load injury is compression fracture, or provide that is a compression fracture. So usually uh, old, age, uh, uh, old age females with osteoporosis, they have compression fracture at this level. So proximal thoracic, rigid structure, flexion injury, corpolumbar junction, it is a junction of immobile segment and mobile segment. The chance of injury is more here. Lower lumbar, it is mobile segment, axial loads. Compression fracture and burst fracture because of axial load is common in lumbar spine. So we can compare our spine to a crane involved in the construction site. Can you see this? This is a crane involved in this construction. So whenever you see a crane, there will be a cable supporting the crane. Okay. So this cable exerts tension pressure. So it exerts tension so that it will. Uh, give stability to the structure. If the cable is cut, the whole structure will fail. This, there is a tension force acting over this cable. So, where the load is suspended, here there is a compression, a compression uh, uh, force acting. So, whenever there is load is hanging, there is a compression force. Whenever there is a cable which is resisting to it, there is a tension force. Same we can apply to the spinal column. So, this is a spinal column. They are standing straight. Usually, the center of gravity of the body falls anterior. Remember, the, cent the, the center of gravity of the body falls anterior. So, anteriorly, there is a compression force acting. Posteriorly, there is a tension force acting. This tension force, okay, this tension force is uh, stabilized or supported by or opposed by the posterior ligament structures. 
like interspinous ligament, supraspinous ligament, passive joint capsules, and ligament conflagum. So, when these posterior ligaments fail or not injured, there will be opening up of the posterior uh, structures. Okay. Anterior, there is a compression force, posterior, there is a tension force. So, this is a, a um, definition of spinal instability given by White and Punjabi. It's a very, very important definition. So you have to just understand the meaning of it. So, what is called as spinal instability? Spinal instability is defined as loss in the ability of the spine, that is, loss in the ability of the spine under physiological loads like walking, standing, sitting to maintain relationship between vertebral structures okay in such a way that there is neither damage nor subsequent irritation to the spinal cord or nerve roots okay so normally so normally if, if, if you apply physiological load to the spine the spine should maintain the relationship between the structures so that there is no injury to the cord or the root if it is not able to maintain that relationship and there is some injury apparent to the nerve root or the uh, cord, that means it is called as spine instability. So you should understand it and you should read it by heart. So coming to the facts about the spinal injury, so usually uh, worldwide there are around 2.5 lakhs to 5 lakhs uh, spinal cord injuries occurring in a year. And 80% of these spine injuries is because of road traffic accidents and fall from height. So this road traffic accident fall from heights is the most common type of injuries occurring in the younger age group and middle age group. In older age group, the most common type of injury is just a trivial fall, fall in the bathroom, such as all those things. So, so the most common age group of the spinal injury is between 20 to 29 years, the most productive year. So whenever you are seeing a uh, spinal injury patient, so whenever you are seeing a spinal injury patient, what you should do? So we should assess them properly. We can classify into accident side response, emergency room response, imaging protocol, and treatment strategy. We'll see one by one. So what is accident side response? So anyway, you are not going to be there on the accident side, but you should teach the ambulance drivers, technicians of your hospital so that they can manage these patients appropriately in the accident side. So whenever there is a patient lying down with a spine injury, so he will be either complaining of neck pain or back pain or patient will be complaining of weakness of the upper limb or lower limb or patient may be unconscious. So any unconscious patient following road traffic accident, you should think that patient is having an injury along with the spine injury. You should think like that and you should uh, manage the patient appropriately. So if the patient is coming of pain and weakness is there, so you have double issue that patient is having spine injury. So usually while shifting the patient to the spine board, say either you should use a spine board or you can use a stretcher. So the, the, the first mechanism to minimize further injury is log rolling. So log rolling means one uh, attender or one uh, technician should stabilize the spine like this, spine like this. Other two or three members should just rotate the patient so the rotation should be same in the cervical spine and thoracolumbar spine. Okay, which is not like that one patient is holding the cervical spine and others are rotating. So all four members should rotate at the same point of time. So push the spinal board or the stretcher board in, rotate the patient back, strap them back. So this is the this is called as log rolling method. This log rolling method will minimize further injuries. So in my uh, in my small short experience, I've seen. Some patients, they have got some unstable fracture of the thoracic spine. They will walk following injury or they will be shifted in a beach chair. What happens during the shifting? The patient might develop further injury to the cord and neurological damage was not there at the time of injury, it will develop after the time of injury. So that is clear. So, any spinal injury patient, you should think that the patient is having unstable spine and you should handle them properly. So next thing is after shifting the patient to the spine board, the next thing is uh, stabilizing the cervical spine. If, if you are having a spine board in your institute, there is a cervical spine stabilizer attached to it, or you can apply a, a hot cervical collar or a pedalphia collar. So once the patient is shifted to a hospital, next comes emergency room management. 
What are the things we should assess in emergency room? As in any patient, the first thing we should do is airway, breathing, and circulation. So, what why should we think about airway, breathing, and circulation as primary patient? In what way this airway breathing should be uh, in circulation should be affected? It is there. Can you see here? So this is a brain, this is spinal cord. So whenever there is an injury to the spinal cord, above the level of T6, okay, above the level of T6, what happens? There can be injury to the sympathetic chain. So whenever there is an injury to the sympathetic chain, what happens? Parasympathetic uh, 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 signals will, will be dominating. So there will be injury to the there is an injury above the level of T6. Sympathetic chain gets injured. Parasympathetic signals are dominating. What happens? There can be bradycardia. There can be a decrease in the BP. So this is called as neurogenic shock. So what is neurogenic shock? So whenever there is an over overacting of parasympathetic uh, impulses, the patient will have bradycardia with fallen BP. So in other kinds of shock, like if the patient is having a septic shock or hypovolemic shock, patient will have tachycardia, patient will have hypotension. But here, patient will have bradycardia with hypotension. Here, there is no need to rush the fluids. The patient needs dopaminergic drugs, like dopamine or adrenaline support should be started immediately. There is no need to rush the fluids in these kinds of cases. Okay, remember, neurogenic shock, Bradycardia with hypotension. Hypovolemic shock, other shock, tachycardia with hypotension. The treatment in neurogenic shock is only dopaminergic drugs, inotropic drugs like dopamine, dopamine, or noradrenaline. Other thing is a breathing. So you know that uh, if, if the patient is having some associated cervical spine injury also, so what is the root value of free so, phrenic nerve's main root value is C4. If there is an injury at the level of C4 or above the level of C4, what happens? The patient's breathing pattern changes. A diaphragm, if there is a, a diaphragmatic palsy, patient is breathing only with the abdominal muscles. Patient will be, there will be labored breathing. When you identify this, you should give oxygen support. And if the patient is not responding, you may have to, you may have to go for ventilatory support. So, these are the two things. So one thing, when the patient is having cervical spine injury at the level of C4 or above, that will be phrenic nerve injury. As a consequence of phrenic nerve injury, patient will have diaphragmatic palsy, <coughs> leading on to difficulty in breathing. One thing. Second, if the patient is having neurogenic uh, neurogenic shock, patient will have bradycardia with hypotension. You should treat them with uh, inotropic drugs. These are the two things regarding circulation and breathing. Next, come into the neurological uh, examination of the patient. So, what are the uh, neurological examination of the injury patients? So, you have stabilized the patient, you have checked for airway, circulation, and breathing. Now, neurological examination. The first thing you should assess is motor power. Whether the patient is moving the upper limb, finger movement is there, hip movement is there, knee joint movement, no movements are there. So, we have seen in cervical spine, cervical disc class and lumbar disc class. For each room, each uh, specific muscle is there. So accordingly, we should assess the motor power, followed by the sensory examination. So in the in uh, emergency room, we cannot assess all sensations. Usually, we we, uh, we do either pinching the patient for pain, second, light touch, just touching the part. So gradually, you can run your fingers over the body or pinch randomly, and you have to find what is the lowermost sensory level. Third thing is reflexes. The most important reflex in to be assessed in uh, this thing is bulbocalamus reflex. Okay, so in uh, uh, I will come to the bulbocalamus reflex later. So the, the most important things we should assess is whether the patient is having perianal sensation, voluntary anal motor contractions there or not, or greater contractions there. So there can be two kinds of patients. One patient who has got normal neurological. So we need not worry about that. We can shift the patient for X. Other patient 
complete neurological injury. Okay. So if the patient is having weakness or new injury, you should search for if there is any sacral sparring. What is called a sacral sparring? The sacral nerve roots are placed in such a way that the chance of, even if there is a high velocity injury, the chance of sacral nerve root to get damaged is relatively less. You can say not relatively less. See, if there is sacral sparring, that means the chance of neurological improvement is there. Okay? If the sacral sparring is not there, the patient is completely neurological deficit is there, then the chance of recovery is lower. So, so how, how, do, how do you assess for sacral sparring? These are the three things you should see. First thing is perianal sensation, whether the patient is having sensation in the perianal region or not. Second is do a pre-rectal examination and assess voluntary rectal motor function, that is, voluntary anal contraction is there or not. Third is greater flexion. Ask just the patient to move the greater or low. So these are the sacral root function. So when there is sacral sparring, we can call it as incomplete cord injury and the prognosis is good for these kind of patients. So we have seen regarding neurogenic shock. Okay. There is another shock in spinal injury, there is a spinal shock. What is a spinal shock? So usually when there is an injury to the spinal column or the spinal cord, okay, there is a physiological spinal cord shutdown in response to injury. So unable to bear the shock, the spine, there is a physiological shutdown. Okay, that is called as spinal shock. So usually spinal shock is more common in cervical upper thoracic cord injuries. So it is relatively rare in cervical lumbar and lumbar injuries. So what is the features of spinal shock? Usually there can be placid paralysis, okay, from upper limb to lower limb. There won't be any reflexes, any reflex, yeah, lack of sensation, there will be any sensation in the So this is called as spinal shock. So usually the spinal shock will be there for approximately 24 hours to 48 hours. The spinal shock will be there. So, when you are when you are seeing a patient in emergency room, patient is having a fracture, patient is having complete neurological deficit. So, you should not think that patient is fascia A neurology, complete quadriplegia or paraplegia. You should reassess the patient after every 12 hours. So, why we are reassess? You should reassess after every 12 hours. So, the patient might be in spinal shock. So, when he recovers from the spinal shock patient may show some movement, then it is not a complete spinal cord injury, it is an incomplete spinal cord injury, okay. So complete spinal cord injury, the prognosis is poor, incomplete spinal cord injury, the prognosis is better. So to find whether if this patient is complete neurological injury or incomplete neurological injury, the patient, we should know whether the patient has come out of spinal shock or not. The patient, uh, so how to find out whether the patient has come out of spinal shock or not? So we should assess the bulbocavernous reflex. What is bulbocavernous reflex? Do a PR examination. Put your fingers in the red thumb. Pull the catheter or pinch the uh, gland scales. What happens? So there will be a reflex contraction of the uh, anal finger. So you should put the finger into the uh, anus. Either if the patient is catheterized, pull the catheter or pinch the gland scales. That will reflex contraction. So that is called as bulbo cavernous reflex. If this reflex is there, the patient is not in spinal shock. If this reflex is absent, then that means patient is still in the state of spinal shock. Is that clear? Okay. Next, this is the uh, Asia scoring scale which we use. So, what is the Asia scoring scale? So if you are having this Asia scoring scale, we can uh, examine the patient in detail and we can note it down. <clears throat> As I said earlier, each nerve root we should assess muscles separately. For example, C5 is elbow flexion, C6 wrist extension, C7 elbow extension, C8 finger flexion, T1 finger abduction. Likewise from L2 to S1. So, so uh, each nerve root, one particular muscle is assessed and we can score it accordingly. Likewise, there is sensory assessment is there and reflex assessment is there. So this is called as Asian scoring. 
So what does it give? So at the end of the scoring, we can come to a conclusion, patient falls in which, which category. So if the patient is having no motor or sensory function below the level of injury, that is A, that is HIA, it's complete neurological injury. If the patient is having <coughs> no motor function, but sensation is there, that is Asia B. Sensation is in that no motor function. What is Asia C? There is motor function is preserved, but the, the motor function is less than 3 by 5. That is Asia C. Asia D, motor function is preserved, but the muscle power is more than 3 by 5. Asia E, it's normal. So Asia A, complete neurology, no motor function, no sensory function. Asia B, sensation is there, no motor function. Asia C, motor function is there, but the power is less than 3 by 5. Asia D, power is there, the, the power is more than 3 by 5. Asia e is normal. Okay, this is called as Asia grading of purple lumbar or spinal cord injury patients. So you have assessed the patient, you stabilized the patient, uh, you have the, the complete neurological examination was done, whether the patient is in the neurogenic shock or spinal shock has been recorded. Now it's time to go for image assessment of imaging. So the first and primary imaging is X-ray. So I will tell you X-ray, CT scan and MRI, all three are important in any uh, spinal injury. Okay, so you'll go on by one. So the first and foremost which is readily available is X-ray. So if, whenever you are having a spinal injury patient, never hesitate to take X-ray of a painful spinal segment. Even there is mild tenderness in that we need to uh, X-ray of that segment. There is any unconscious patient who is still in the whole spine. So we can spend for us, spend number spend all three parts should be screened in case of unconscious patient. There is any spatial injury, facial injury is there. You should always assess cervical spine injuries there or not. So X-ray can give you 80% reduction rate of X-ray cervical spinal fractures. So now we are dealing mainly with the thoracolumbar fractures. So thoracolumbar fractures we can cover in two X-rays. So so first we should ask for X-ray thoracic spine AP and lateral. Second, X-ray lumbar spine AP lateral. Sometimes we can cover lower thoracic and lumbar level by ordering X-ray thoracolumbar spine AP lateral. So this is the X-ray thoracolumbar spine. So it covers from around T6 to S1 segment. So this is the uh, thoracolumbar spine. If you're suspecting any injury in thorac thoracic or lumbar spine, it's mandated to cover from T1 segment to sacrum segment. You should not leave any segment without screening. Okay? Okay. So what are the things we should notice in uh, X-ray? See, for example, this is an X-ray of the lumbar spine, AP view. See, AP view, you can see the borders of the uh, vertebral body. So this is the L3 vertebra, it's upper end plate. This is the lower end plate, which is parallel. So this is rectangular vertebral body. This is okay. When you see this L2 vertebral body, can you see the difference? Can you see there is a collapse of the vertebral body? The end plates are not separated like there in L3 vertebral body. It's nearby. That means there is a fracture of the L2 vertebra. Okay. If there is a shortening of the vertebral body height, we call it as burst fracture. Okay. Or it can be a compression fracture also. So AP view, first thing you should see is whether the height of the vertebral body is maintained in AP view or not. Second, there can be associated transverse process fractures. You can see here, so here the transverse process is okay. Here the transverse, there is a transverse process fracture is there. So what is the importance of transverse process fracture in thoracolumbar region? In thoracolumbar region, the transverse process serves as the bit for the kidneys. Whenever there is a fracture of the transverse process, you should suspect that can be a renal injury also. You should check for whether the patient is having hematuria or not. This is very, very important. Next thing you have to see is the pedicles. You can see here, usually the pedicles you can see like an eye. And you see that pedicles, oval shaped pedicles here, oval shaped pedicles here. So the, the distance between the pedicles, okay? So here, there is a distance between pedicles. Here also there is a distance between particles. Both are equal. 
so the pedicles are symmetrically arranged but can you see here here the pedicles are separated compared to the upper vertebra so if, if there is widening of the interpedicular distance that that confirms that there is a burst fracture okay the first thing you have to see is whether the vertebral body height is maintained or not second thing is whether the pedicles are arranged in an equidistant manner or not what is the third thing you have to see third thing is what is the alignment of the spine okay you can see here you should you should trace the spinous process whether the spinous process is the same line or not when you draw a line and there is a break in the line that means there is a translation injury very very high velocity injury we suspect this okay so in ap view vertebral body height pedicle distance and alignment of the spine that's it so added to that we should also look for there is if there is any other injury associated with the thoracic spine injury so you can see here this lung field is okay okay here you can see there is a air in the lung field so so patient with l1 uh, unstable burst fracture there was associated diaphragmatic injury with diaphragmatic hernia okay this was we, we, we just suspected this with air shadow and was confirmed with the ct scan and many trochlear spine injuries that can be associated with fracture with hemothorax or pneumothorax you should see for you can see here there was there, there, there was a trochlear injury fracture associated with multiple rib fracture with hemothorax so this we should not miss in the case of spine coming to the lateral view so lateral view what are the things we should see so first thing is we should trace the anterior vertebral margins and we should trace the posterior vertebral margins and we should trace the spinous process okay interspinous the supraspinous ligament so the line between the spinous process so these are the three lines we should see what is the line anterior vertebral column line posterior vertebral column line and interspinous lines anterior vertebral column posterior vertebral the lines there is any change in the arrangement of the vertebral body there is a breakage of the line we should suspect translation injury for example see here okay what is this second thing you should see is whether there is any loss of height of that is there or not you just compare with the lower and the upper vertebra so here the vertebral body is a uh, spine shaped vertebral body you can see here this l1 vertebral body there is a compression there is a loss of height this is called as compression fracture of l1 vertebra okay let us view here you can see there is uh, associated with compression fracture there is also kyphosis at the upper lumbar level so can you see there is a significant loss of height leading to kyphosis so compared to the previous the loss of height was around 50 50 percentage here the loss of height is more than 50 percentage we should always assess how much of the height is lost this is also important second thing as i told earlier we should trace the anterior vertebral line and posterior vertebral line so here when you trace line along the posterior vertebral body you can see there is a discontinuation so there is a dislocation dislocation of vertebral body between t11 and t12 vertebral body okay so here it is very obvious in sometimes the dislocation or the translation will be very little you will you, you should be very cautious not to miss it third thing very important thing so you have you have you have seen the vertebral body what is in the anterior vertebral body line posterior vertebral body line so you should always look into the spinous process spinous process is very 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 important this spinous process fracture or if there is widening of the spinous process it indicates that there is injury of the posterior ligament complex structure so here you can see that is so this is sacrum l5 l4 l3 l2 so there is a compression fracture of l2 but there is associated fracture in the spinous process so it is a continuous fracture so fracture starts from the vertebral body through to the facet joint through the spinous process it is highly unstable fracture 
For example, if you have missed to see this fracture, you may think that this is just a simple compression fracture. It's not a simple compression fracture. It's a highly unstable flexion distraction injury. So whenever you see a fracture in the spinous process, along with fracture of the vertebral body, you should think of flexion distraction injury. There is a flexion injury in the anterior aspect. There is a distraction injury in the posterior aspect. There is shortening occurring in the anterior aspect. There is a lengthening occurring in the posterior aspect. That is called as flexion distraction injury. We should also look for is there any widening between the spinous processes? See, there is a spinous process here, there is a spinous process here. So, there is this, the distance between spinous processes normal. It is also normal. If there is abnormal widening of the spinous process, then that means that the interspinous ligaments has ruptured. Okay? You should think about that. So, in later view, we should see for the vertebral body compression, alignment of the vertebral body, look for the spinous process fracture, look for the there is any increased distance between the spinous processes. Okay? Okay. Then comes the, the X-ray participle. What are the things you should see in the AP view? What are the things you see in the lateral view? To be frank, X-ray many times give much more important points than an MRI. Okay? Then, so what are the patients? Uh, next stage is CT scan and MRI. So, who, who are the patients we should get CT scan and MRI? Any patient with neurological deficit, the patient is having weakness, you should get an MRI scan and CT scan done. Okay? It's not like that, you should get an MRI alone, not like CT alone. It's not enough. In our institution, the protocol is whenever we are doing an MRI scan, they will they will find out what the fracture, where the fracture level is, and the patient will be shifted to CT scan <coughs> and that fracture level, particular level, they will cut, they will take. CT scan. Okay, so you have X-ray, MRI, CT, so that classification and decision making becomes very very easier. So, any patient with uh, neurological deficit, we should get MRI scan and CT scan. If the patient is having normal neurology, okay, you have got an X-ray, there is a fracture. Patient is having normal neurology. Whether to go for MRI, CT scan or not, in some patients. If you, if you consider the patient is having a stable fracture, no need to go for MRI CT scan. You can treat the patient with this X-ray alone. If you think that the patient is having unstable fracture, then you subject them to MRI and CT scan. How to assess that? Usually, usually these are the things. If the compression of the vertebral body is more than 50 percentage, okay? The compression is more than 50 percentage compared to the adjacent levels. It can be unstable fracture. Go for MRI scan, CT scan. One thing. Second thing, if there is a kyphosis, kyphosis of more than 20 degrees compared to the, this, all these values are in comparison to the adjacent normal vertebra. Okay. So compared to this vertebra, this vertebra, the compression is more than 50 percentage. Compared to this vertebra, there is a kyphosis angle of more than 20 degrees. That means it can be an unstable fracture. Subject the patient to MRI scan and CT scan, even if the neurology is normal. Here again, there is a fracture here. You, you are seeing a fracture of the posterior element. That is, spinous process fracture is there. But there is a widening of spinous process. That means that it can be an unstable fracture. Subject the patient to MRI scan. Very rarely there can be a translation injury. Mild subluxation dysfunction can be there without neurological deficit. Subject them to MRI scan. Okay. Any patient get an X-ray done. The patient is having neurological deficit. Get MRI scan and CT scan done. The patient is normal neurology. There are certain points like more than 50 percent height loss, more than 20 degrees of kyphosis, posterior structure involvement. We get MRI scan and CT scan. Okay. Come into the classification. So while I explain the classification, I will tell you the points to be seen in MRI scan and CT scan. There are many classifications to start with. I will just highlight three important classifications. Okay. 
So now what we are following is this clicks classification. That is very, very important. That is the uh, most appropriate and the most followed uh, classification system. So the Dennis classification is the first one to appear. Still it holds good. Next comes the Evo classification and Telix. So what is the Dennis classification? It is based on three column concept. The spinal column is divided into three columns. What are the three columns? Anterior column, middle column, and posterior column. Anterior column includes anterior longitudinal ligament, anterior annulus, and anterior part of the vertebral bone. Okay? Anterior longitudinal ligament, anterior part of the body, and anterior part of the annulus. Posterior middle column consists of posterior part of the vertebral body, posterior part of the disc, and posterior longitudinal ligament. Okay? This is the middle column. Coming to the posterior column, very important column. Come consists of pedicle, facet joint, spinous process, all the ligaments, ligament of flavor, interspinous ligament, and supraspinous ligament. Okay, so this is the anterior column, middle column, and posterior column. So the his theory is whenever there is fracture involving only one column, for example, there is only anterior part of the middle body fracture, or there is only spinous process fracture, only transverse process fracture. It is a stable fracture. Involvement of only one column is a stable fracture. If there is involvement of two columns, then it is an unstable fracture. So that is simple, very simple. Two columns, unstable fracture. I will tell you with the some examples. Here, so this was a uh, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. L1 compression fracture is there. Okay? This is the L1 compression fracture. So what is the anterior column? Anterior part of the vertebral body is anterior column. It is fracture. Posterior part of the vertebral body, I don't think it is fracture. Can you see the height? This is the height of the posterior, posterior part of the body. Height of the posterior part of the body. The height is maintained. That means the posterior column is intact. Here, there is no widening of spinous process, spinous process or normal. That means anterior column is fracture while middle column and posterior column is intact. It is a stable fracture. We can treat conservatively. Come here. So there is a fracture dislocation. That means there is vertebral body fracture, the disc is disrupted, and the facet joint is dislocated. That means all three columns are involved. It's a highly unstable fracture. Very simple. Any only one column involvement, treat conservatively. There is more than one column involvement, Surgery is needed. It's unstable fracture. But the main drawback of this genus classification was it, it, it did not take into account the posterior ligament structure, one thing. Second, the neurology of the patient is not taken into account in this classification. Next comes the EVO classification. EVO classification is a bigger classification. I'll just give you an outline. So there are the main fractures are classified into by the mechanism of injury. So what is the mechanism of injury? According to that, it is classified. So type A, type B, type C. You can see the mnemonics here. Type A, it is axial compression. That means patient has fall, uh, falling from above. There is only axial compression. Okay? There is no other uh, force acting. Only axial compression. What happens? There is shortening of the vertebral body. Okay? So type A, Come, it includes compression fracture and burst fracture. Type A, it is compression injury. There is shortening of the vertebral body. So the examples are compression fracture and burst fractures. Okay. Next comes the distraction type of injury. I was saying flexion distraction. What is flexion distraction? So there is a flexion force anteriorly. And there is a distraction force posteriorly. Okay, you are seeing the example flexion distraction injury. So, what happens? There is lengthening occurring posteriorly. So, that is called as flexion distraction injury. Even though oh, there is flexion distraction injuries occur, this anterior, uh, this thing will be maintained. Anterior vertebral body line, posterior vertebral body line will be maintained. I repeat. In flexion distraction injury, that is type B injuries, there will be lengthening of the posterior column, 
there can be shortening of the anterior column but the alignment of the vertebral bodies will be the same there won't be any dislocation will not be there okay this is called as distraction injuries chance fracture you will be getting a bony chance fracture there is a through and through fracture through the vertebral body extending of the spinous process that comes under distraction type of injury type b injuries next is the type c what is type c it is torsional injury or rotation injury so there is a rotation injury what happens there is a, is a high velocity injury there is a fracture there is translation either in the ap view or lateral view so we can call these injuries as dislocation also this torsion injuries or rotation injuries can be called as dislocation so ap view axial compression it can be called as uh, either example is compression fracture and burst fracture type b injury its flexion distraction injury anteriorly there is flexion posteriorly there is distraction there is widening between the spinous processes this is called as distraction injuries but the alignment of the anterior vertebral line posterior vertebral line alignment will be the same third is rotation type of injuries where there is dislocation will be there we can call it as translational injuries or fracture dislocations type 3 some examples for it type a can same examples type a axial low there is a burst fracture of l2 vertebra this type a injury here there is flexion injury anteriorly there is distraction injury posteriorly can you see that spinous process fracture and there is a widening of the spinous process this is a distraction injury this comes as type b flexion distraction type of injuries type c there is dislocation this is rotation type of injury this is called as type c we have type a type b and type c so here type b injuries are unstable type c injuries are unstable while in type a some injuries are stable and some injuries are unstable so coming to coming to the uh, further improvement of the classification system the most recent one the most recent one is felix classification what is felix classification torco lumbar injury classification and severe score this is called as p l i c s torco lumbar injury classification and severe score it takes into account three uh, sets of this thing first is morphology what is morphology So, what is the fracture type? Whether it is compression fracture, burst fracture, translation rotation, or distraction. Next, the posterior ligament X complex. Whether the posterior ligament complex is intact or whether you suspect the injury or not, whether it is completely injured or not. Third is neurological status. Whether it is intact, incomplete injury, complete neurological injury, and accordingly the points are given. so here we come to the morphology of the fracture so what is the morphology of fracture here there are four morphological pattern is seen one is compression okay there is only anterior column involvement that is called as compression fracture you do one point to compression fracture one point okay Two is burst fracture, where anterior vertebral body is also fractured, posterior vertebral body is also fractured. The posterior vertebral body height is also reduced. This is called as burst fracture. To see a burst fracture, you can give two points. Okay, compression fracture one, burst fracture two. Next comes the fracture dislocation. That is type C injuries of AVO, rotation injuries, fracture dislocation. so there is dislocation uh, either the ap view there is translation on the lateral view there is translation translation dislocation or one of the same so this is this carries three points so the maximum instability points is given to flag our flexion distraction injury that is type b injuries in ebo classification 
so there is the flexion compression fracture of the vertebral body while there is rupture of the posterior ligaments and the sinus process this is called as flexion distraction type of injury i repeat compression fracture one first fracture two points fracture dislocation three points flexion distraction four points okay these are the examples here there is an uh, l1 vertebral body compression fracture see here anterior vertebral body height is lost while posterior vertebral body is maintained ct scan is taken again the posterior vertebral body is normal anterior fracture is there mri same so other there is no posterior like posterior structures are not involved so it is a simple compression fracture how many points will give one point then comes the second here there is an l1 cup fracture is there okay l1 fracture what taking you see this can we can see there is a involvement of the whole of the body is there in the axial in the sagittal cuts when you see closely look into the sagittal cut here is the fracture line running from the anterior part of the body through to the posterior part of the body so the posterior body is also involved here okay that means it is a burst fracture burst fracture carries two points so here is a fracture dislocation so dislocation means it is moved from its original location can you see that 5 4 3 2 1 12 11 12 t 11 t 12 there is complete dislocation is that you can see the facet joints here it's so aligned well so this is superior facet This is the inferior facet. This is the normal facet joint. But here, there is a dislocation of the facet joint. So this is a translation injury or a dislocation injury. How many points? It carries three points. Next comes from flexion distraction injury. Same example. You can see there is a uh, flexion compression compression fracture of the vertebral body here. There is injury to the spinous process. There is widening of the spinous process. So it is a clear cut flexion distraction injury. shortening anteriorly and lengthening posteriorly you can see the ct scan also there is a fracture in the spinous process so flexion distraction injury carries maximum points carries four points okay so we have decided what is the morphology next comes the posterior ligamentous complex whether it is intact suspected of injury it is a, it is based on the mri the morphology is mainly based on x ray and ct this posterior lumbar ligaments we need a mri so these are the important posterior lumbar uh, i have said earlier also i will repeat it so this is a facet joint facet joint capsule ligament of flavor and interspinous ligament and supraspinous ligaments i repeat going from posterior supraspinous ligament interspinous ligament ligament of flavor and facet joint capsules these four are the uh, posterior ligament complex ligaments so in certain cases this ligament is will be ruptured what are the cases see when you are palpating the patient okay suddenly you feel a gap along the sinus process you are running the thumb at the level of the fracture when you see a gap that means there is break in the posterior ligamentous or posterior structures there is a gap that means posterior ligament complex is injured okay one thing second thing splaying of the spinous process if there is a fracture in the spinous process of the widening or without fracture there is a widening of the space in between two spinous process it is called as splaying of the spinous process third thing is if there is any facet joint subluxation or dislocation okay the so fourth point translation of one vertebra over the other in these all four conditions we should take that the posterior ligament is complete completely gone give three points so what are the four point four things i will repeat when you are palpating there is a gap okay second thing widening of the spinous process third thing there is subluxation of the facet joint fourth thing translation of one vertebra over the other so this widening of the spinous process cannot occur without rupture of the interspinous ligaments 
this passive joint subluxation cannot occur before the rupture of the passive joint capsule. Got it. Translation cannot occur without again without a uh, rupture of the passive joint or interstitial. So when you see these injuries, it is taken that posterior ligament complex is completely ruptured. You can do full three points. Okay. For example, see here, so touch and distraction injury. There is spinous process fracture is there. Then that means the posterior ligament complex is supraspinous ligament is ruptured. Can you three points? Here there is facet joint dislocation is there. That means the facet joint capsule should have rupture. Then you can give three points. So you are not seeing this thing. There is some fracture. When you see an MRI, there is edema in the posterior ligament structure. So this is T2 spinous process. This is L1 spinous process. In between the spinous process, you are seeing edema. Edema means what I have told. In T2 weighted image, if you see a whitish thing, that should be either liquid or it should be an edema. Or you can see in the stir image also. What is stir image? It's a fat suppressed image. So in these images, you will see an edema here. So you are not seeing any facet joint dislocation, any translation. But we are only seeing edema in the posterior aspect. Then you are suspecting a posterior ligament joint capsule injury. You can give two points. Suspicion. Just two points. It's an example. Cervical spine. I'm just giving an example. So you are, since the cervical spine MRI, there is mild compression fracture here. But there is an edema in the posterior part of the spinous process. The interspinous ligaments. So we can give two points. Okay, suspicion. Edema in the MRI, two points. If there is no edema, there is no facet, uh, you are not suspecting any injury, you just give zero points. Okay, so morphology is you have determined, you have assigned marks, then again you have assigned marks for the posterior ligament complex. Then third comes the neurologic status. Neurologic status, just think the patients have intact neurology, zero points, there's no points. There is a no root compression. For example, if there is an L, a L5 vertebral body, the patient is having foot drop. Okay? Because of the compression of the L4, L5 no root. You can give two points. If there is a complete, patient is paraplegic, complete cord injury, two points. If the patient is having incomplete cord injury, what is incomplete cord injury? Patient is having weakness, but patient is having some toe movements. And the sphincter contraction is there. Said earlier, sacral sparing is there. Incomplete neurology. Okay. Asia, Asia A is complete neurology. Asia B, sensation is intact. There is no motor. Asia C and D comes in this category. Asia C, Asia D, muscle power is there. That comes under incomplete cord injury. Or if there is a cauda equina syndrome following fracture. They will have maximum points, three points. I repeat, the neurology is intact, zero points. Only nerve root involvement is there, two points. Complete cord injury, two points. Incomplete cord injury and cord eye syndrome, three points. You might wonder why they are given lower points for complete cord injury and why they are given more points for the incomplete cord injury. So there are two patients in the emergency. One is having complete paraplegia, other is having incomplete paraplegia. Which patient should you take for surgery at the earliest? Complete paraplegia is gone. The recovery chance is very, very poor. But the patient with incomplete cord injury, the chance of recovery is there. To delay the surgery, the chance of worsening is also there. So the, the, so the importance of incomplete cord injury is very, very important. So the patients with incomplete cord injury should be treated first. So they are given more points to the incomplete cord injury. Very, very important. Okay. So you have to assess it. So accordingly, you are putting points. When you put the points, so this is the flow chart. So you are finding what is the mechanism of fracture, assign points, compression, one point, burst, two points, translation, rotation injuries, three points, distraction injuries, four points. Then you go for the posterior ligament as complex. No injury, zero points, suspected injury, two points, definitive posterior long ligament injury, three points. Then come to the neurology status. You are assigning points according to the neurology status. Then you should go to the treatment according to the total score. What is the guidelines? 
If there is the score is between 0 to 3, non surgical management, conservative management. If the score is four, more than or equal to 5, you have to go and operate. What kind of surgery? Stabilize the patient. The patient is having part compression, decompress the patient. Okay. What if the patient is false in between? 4. Then the surgeon has to take the call whether to operate or whether to console. The patient is a patient decision. This is the surgeon's surge decision. Sorry. So, telling score 0 to 3, non surgical conservative management, more than or equal to 5, surgical management. If the score is 4 points, then it can be managed conservatively or surgically. The decision should be taken by the treating surgeon. So, what is the management plan? So, any management, any fracture spine, there is no role of complete bed rest. Okay, in the, as far as the thoracic lumbar fracture is concerned. So, you think that the patient is having stable fracture, you also to take this for one or two days, then gradually mobilize them with thoracic lumbar brace. Okay, limited mobilization, at least to the bottom. If the patient is having unstable fracture, you fix the patient and mobilize. If the patient is having unstable fracture, you do pericostal fixation. Patients having normal neurology, you make the patient walk the next day. The screws will take care. Or if the patients have a neurological deficit, you can at least make the patient sit on the next day and wheelchair mobilization can be started. So there is no role for prolonged bed rest. So what is the non-operative management? So, so usually there is a stable compression fracture or a stable burst fracture. So we can just apply a thoracic lumbar brace. I repeat. You should apply thoraco lumbar brace. Then, even if the patient, the patient is having fracture at the L4 vertebra or L2 vertebra, you apply thoraco lumbar brace. LS will, will not solve the problem. Even if the patient is having lumbar spine fracture, LS belt will not help. You should go for thoraco lumbar belt like this. Okay? So, when lying down, there is no need for brace. The patient can lie down. Patient can turn to that side or this side without any problem in stable fractures. Okay. When the patient is getting up from the bed, they should turn to one side with the help of some other person who can sit and then they can apply it well. Then they can walk slowly to the bathroom. So this is the protocol. So every two weeks, we have to take and check x ray. Why the check x ray? To assess whether there is any collapse or not. If there is no collapse, at the end of six weeks, we can remove the belt and we can allow the patient to start gradual activities. Okay? That is the protocol for conservative management. Protocol of work belt, limited mobilization, x ray every two weeks, assess whether the fracture is healing or not. If, if every two weeks there is no further prolapse, we can term the patient is healing well. If there is increase in prolapse, follow continuously. If the prolapse is more than 50% of the body weight, then you will have to intervene. Can do surgery. This is the protocol for our, uh, surgical for conservative management. Come into the surgical management. Surgical management is for all unstable fractures. You can tell score for the more than equal to five or unstable fractures. They should do surgery. So what surgery? Usually, we do posterior pudic screw fixation. So, pedicle screw is such a wonderful instrument. It can have hold of all three columns. So, pedicle screw we are putting from the posterior aspect. It goes into the pedicle and it also goes into the till the anterior part of the middle column. So, this pedicle screw will, will hold posterior column, middle column, and anterior column. So, this pedicle screw is a wonderful instrument and we can stabilize the unstable fracture with these pedicle screws. If the patient is having neurological deficit with compression, we can do for decompression of the neural structures. Okay? If the patient is having normal neurology and the cord compression is not there, only it's unstable fracture, then we can just put pedicle screw and come out without decompression. Decompression is needed. Only when there is neurological deficit, patient is having weakness or patient is having very significant cord compression. 
Water compression is not there. Neurology is normal. There is no need for decompression. Just stabilize and come out. So, so we will see uh, management of each and every structure separately. So we have got four kinds of fracture patterns. One is compression fracture, burst fracture, fracture dislocation, flexion distraction. Okay. Compression fracture we are going to manage conservatively. Burst fractures, some patient can have stable burst, some patient can have unstable burst. This kind of unstable burst only we are going to operate. So what are the unstable burst fractures? Unstable burst fractures are the burst fractures with kyphosis more than 20 degrees or with loss of more than 50% of the anterior middle body height. Okay, so these constitutes unstable burst fracture. Kyphosis more than 20 degrees, loss of more than 50% of the anterior middle body height. So these are unstable burst fractures. So what are unstable? What what we should do? We should do pedicle screw fixations. Many times we have seen pedicle screw fixation. So there is a, uh, a burst fracture of L1 vertebra. So we have put, this is the pedicle screw. So we have put pedicle screw at T12 and we have two pedicle screw at L2. Is that enough? What will happen? Whenever there is an axial load, because of the cantilever effect, there is high rates of failure. What happens? There is when the axial load, these screws will not hold. There can be screw breakage, there can be kyphotic deformity. So, So, fixation one level above, one level below is not indicated in any kind of fractures. You should forget this, this kind of surgery. So, what we should do? So, we should do, we can put screw in the fracture vertebra also. So, this is called as, uh, this is the correct treatment option for unstable burst fractures. So this is, for example, this is L1 unstable burst fracture. Why am I calling as unstable burst fracture? There is unstable burst fracture because there is a kyphotic kyf de de uh, deformity of more than 20 degrees. The loss of uh, vertebral body height is also more than 50 percent. It's an unstable burst fracture. So when I take a CT scan, I look for the pedicle. So you see, this is the vertebral body. This is the posterior arch. This is the transverse process. This is the pedicle. Pedicle connects the posterior arch to the vertebral body. You see, the ped pedicle is not fractured. Pedicle is intact. So, when the pedicle is intact, we can put pedicle screw into the fracture vertebra also. So, what we have done, we have put pedicle screws at T12 and L2. And at L1, we have used a small screw into the this pedicle. So, this screw can, pedicle screw, additional pedicle screw, increases the stability and it can withstand the axial compression it will not fail so this is the standard mode of treatment for burst fractures so burst fracture one level above one level below fixation with medical screw in the fracture vertebra also remember this this is the correct way of treating the thoracolumbar burst fractures okay next comes the other two categories Flexion dislocation, fracture dislocation, and flexion distraction. Both this fracture dislocation and flexion distraction movies are highly unstable fractures. Highly unstable fractures. So, one level above, one level below with fracture in the pedicle screw will not help. What we should do? We should go for two levels above and two levels below. I will show the examples. So here we have seen the same example, 5, 4, 3, 2, L2 flexion distraction injury. There is a flexion injury here, there is a distraction injury, it's a flexion distraction injury. So what we have done, we have done a fixation, two levels above and two levels below. Here also we have put the medical screw, but it is four level fixation. So this is, since it is a highly unstable fracture, we have done 
four levels of fixation. Next comes the fracture dislocation. It's it is T level T two fracture dislocation. So this is highly unstable fracture. We should go for two levels above and two levels below. Same was done. Two levels above, two levels below. Reduce and fix. So I repeat. Burst fracture is a relatively low velocity injury. We can do one level above, one level below fixation with screw in the fracture vertebra. While in case of flexion distraction and fracture dislocation, those are high velocity injuries. We should go for two levels above and two levels below fixation. Should be clear. Okay. Third thing: Is there any room for anterior approach? Usually, when there is retropulse. Fragment. Okay. What is retropulse fragment? You can see here. So this is the retropulse fragment. Can you see that? This is the vertebral body. There is a fracture in the vertebral body, and the fragment has traveled into the canal, compressing the cord. So this is the retropulse fragment. So when this retropulse fragment is compressing the cord, okay, without any posterior ligament injury. Posterior ligament is intact, but the uh, vertebral body, the retropulse fragment, retropulse body is compressing the cord. In that case, anterior approach will be better. You do an retropulse approach or panthoracic approach, remove the whole vertebral body, decompress the cord, and reconstruct the anterior cord. But nowadays, so I said in uh, thoracolumbar infections, so we there is a transpedicular approach. Through the pedicle, we can go inside. Okay, we can scoop out the fracture fragments, and using this uh, smooth, we call it as L punch. Smooth, tiny L punch. We can introduce anterior to the cord and push the fragments down. So this can be done instead of anterior approach, because anterior approach has got its own morbidity and mortality. Posterior approach is very easy. So what we can do is we can put a pedicle screws, decompress. Through the transpedicular approach, go and push the fragment down. So this is called as transpedicular approach of decompression. We can do that. So that brings to the end of the presentation. So we have seen uh, for unstable burst fracture, one level above, one level below, with pedicle screw in the fracture fragment, fracture dislocation, fraction distraction, two level above, two level below. Whenever there is neurological injury. We can do decompression, or, or there is anterior approach mainly for there is a retropulse fragment. But through the posterior transpedicular approach, transpedicular approach also we can address the uh, retropulse fragments. So that comes to the end. We just show some two three examples of how I have made the uh, scoring. So 43 year old male with a retropulse fracture, Asia D neurology. The neurology is incomplete neurology. What is the scope of incomplete neurology? It's three. Complete neurology is two. Incomplete neurology is three. So neurology is three. Comes the fracture pattern. What is the fracture pattern here? See the see the this thing. So there is a burst fracture here. But in addition to that, can you see a fracture in the spinous process here? See. That means what is the thing? There is a flexion injury along with the distraction of the posterior ligament, posterior this thing. There is rupture of the supraspinous ligament. So this should be a flexion distraction type of injury. What is the score? It's four. Neurology three. It's four. Again, what is going to be the ligament of PLC structure in all flexion distraction injury? The posterior ligament structure is involved. That means three points. The total is seven to ten points. So the the decision is you have to go for surgery. Next example: a 36-year-old male, T11 fracture, Asia E neurology. Asia E means normal neurology. Therefore, zero points for neurology. Come to the fracture pattern. See here. Can you see the fracture pattern here? The vertebral body. There is a fracture of the vertebral body. Okay, but there is also distraction injury here. 
can you see that so this is the facet joint of the upper thing that is fractured through the pedicle okay here is the facet lower facet joint this is the lower facet joint this is the upper facet joint you can see how much distance between the two facet joints it is definitely a distraction injury flexion distraction type of injury so you can see you can see in the yes, this can also you can see there is a fracture here there is a fracture through the pedicle okay so flexion distraction injury what is the point so four points if it is going to be flexion distraction injury then the posterior ligament structure is also involved again it's a three points neurology is zero morphology of the dysfunction distraction it's four points posterior ligament structure is involved it's three points it's seven points that means we have to operate this patient what kind of surgery so flexion distraction injury so we have to go two levels above two levels below so this is five. Five, four, three, two, one, twelve, T twelve. So what I will do? I will do put screws in the T ten, T eleven. I will leave T twelve. I will put screws in L one and L two. Okay, this is the T ten to L two posterior instrumental stabilization. There is no cord compression. There is no neurological deficit. So there is no need for decompression in this patient. This is a surgical uh, treatment strategy. Next comes the 63-year-old male, L1 fracture, Asia E neurology. Asia E means normal neurology. The score for neurology is zero. Coming to the fracture pattern. So X-ray wise, you can see the vertebral body height is lost. So there is significant vertebral body height is there. This is a CT scan. Can you see that? Sorry, I'm going to the previous case. Sorry. Just hold on for a second and come to the correct slide. So L1 fracture. So you can see here, as vertebral body, there is loss of more than 50 percent of the vertebral body. There is kyphosis. Okay. Posterior release spinous process fracture. I don't know. It's not clear. We we'll go for the CT scan. CT scan. Can you see this? It's vertebral body. Vertebral body. There is fracture of the vertebral body. See the spinous process here. There is fracture in the spinous process. So that means it is a flexion distraction type of injury. So the score is four. We'll go to the MRI scan. MRI scan, usually in flexion distraction injury, what will be the PA? The status of posterior ligament complex in flexion distraction injury, posterior ligament complex will be injured. You should take it like that. So the posterior ligament complex injury is three. So total neurology is intact, zero points. The morphology is flexion, distraction type of injury, it's four points. The posterior ligament complex is injured, so it's three points. Total it is seven points. So the management of management is surgery. What kind of surgery? Posterior stabilization. There is a fracture here, T11. It's a flexion distraction injury, two levels above and two levels below. So we can start from T9, T10, we can put screws. We can leave the T11, we can put screws in T12 and L1. So this T9 to L1 posterior instrument stabilization. Any need for decompression? No. Neurology is normal, so there is no need for decompression. Okay. I think you will be clear. So I will. Uh... So who are having questions? You can unmute yourself. And you can start asking questions. Any questions?
Krishna. Yeah, yeah, same to well. Uh, what is the ro role of uh, percutaneous pedicle screw fixation in thoracolumbar okay, fractures? Thoracolumbar fractures. So percutaneous fixations can be done in cases where there is no need for decompression. So the previous uh, two, two cases I showed was a flexion distraction type of injury without neurological deficit. Okay. So there is no need for uh, uh, decompression. In that case, we can do percutaneous fixation. So usually we will be opening, the, we will be erasing the muscles, we will opening the posterior aspect, then we will put the pedicle screws. In percutaneous techniques, we can under the guidance of CR, we can do per, percutaneous screws like uh, uh, closed K nailing, closed interlocking nailing. Same like that, we can do percutaneous pedicle screws and we can insert the rod through the skin. So it's an advanced technique and uh, up to four levels we can go for percutaneous pedicle screw fixation. Okay. Uh, to be frank, my experience in percutaneous screw is limited. I have done only one or two cases for uh, three level fixation. Sir, good evening, sir. Clear, sir. Hello, clear, sir. Sir, hi, sir. Uh, do you have any doubts? Sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, clear, sir. Sir, uh, actually, uh, retro pulse to fragment in all cases, we can leave it as such. We can leave it as such. But we can cut the fragment. No, not needed. So, for example, if the patient is having L1 burst fracture, okay. there is a significant retro pulse fragment. Okay. But patient is having normal neurology. Okay. Then there is no need to decompress that level. Or there is no need to remove that retro pulse fragment. Okay. If the patient is having a new bladder bowel injury or patient is having lower limb weakness, then you should uh, go for posterior decompression or anterior decompression. No, so, so actually, if, what I'm asking is with the neurological deficit, if there is retropulsive fragment, we are decompressing, sir. But to push the fragment anteriorly, is it necessary for all the frag, uh, fractures? Or not. So, for example, uh, I am, uh, it's a little bit of a controversial question. If the, there are two patients with worse fracture with irritable fragment, both are having deficit, okay? Oh. If one patient is having lower limb weakness along with bladder bowel involvement, oh. I will try to push the irritable fragment down. If the patient is having only lower limb weakness without bladder bowel involvement, oh. then I will leave the irritable fragment without touching it. Okay. So this is my uh, principle of practicing. Because anti, there is anterior compression, when we relieve it, the chance of bladder bowel recovery is better as to the literature. So whenever there is bladder bowel involvement, try to push retropulse fragment possible. So retropulse fragment with the bladder bowel uh, involvement is the indication to push that? Or to push, yeah, definitely, definitely. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you. Sir, good evening, sir. Navaldi, sir. Navaldi, good evening, Navaldi. Good evening. Sir, I asked like, uh, you asked in uh, last case, which uh, example you have showed. Yes. If the patient is more than 6 to 70 years of old age, he is coming to clinic with uh, more than 50% vertebral body collapse. Yes. But there is no deficit. Okay. So we need to go for uh, MRI or we can wait. Okay. So you yes, yes. So, so you are looking at the osteoporotic compression fractures. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, 6 year old male, female, with a trivial fall, there is a compression fracture. Uh, two things is, there is, in my practice, I don't advise them MRI routinely. So it's an okay. osteoporotic fracture, you are taking x-ray, you are thinking it's a stable burst fracture, you can keep conservatively. But nowadays, recently I am getting MRI done for these patients also. Why? Because not to assess the neurological status or the cord compression or whether it is stable or not stable, but rather to assess, see whether it is a pathological collapse or not. It can be a spinal metastasis, with the, with the, the only symptom being a compression fracture. So, quite a few times we have missed that. So, uh, in if the patient comes to clinic, we can wait for a week. If the pain not subsides, we can go for MRI. Or definitely, 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 you can take your time. It's not an emergency. 
if the patient is having without neurological deficit patient is coming walking few and you are assessing you are having a diagnosing and compression fracture without mri you can treat the patient okay when the patient is not responding at that time you can go for mri thank you sir welcome sir uh, good evening yes, yes sir sometimes when we have got spinal injuries with congenital deformities like uh, limbus vertebra and the teardrop signs are sometimes very confusing limbus yes. vertebra yes sir yes sir yes sir that is an anterior intervertebral body disc prolapse may confuse you with an avulsion fracture from the anterior part of the vertebra most commonly seen in the cervical spine and it is called as teardrop sign very very often they ask that uh, question yes sir and the, the next point is what is the role of a uh, vertebroplasty and kyphoplasty in spinal injuries sir actually the vertebroplasty kyphoplasty is mainly for osteoporotic compression fractures which is not healing no so if the for example if the now he was asking a question how to manage osteoporotic fractures so uh, osteoporotic fractures we treat mainly by conservative management the patient is not responding the fracture is not healing if you take an x ray there is a vacuum phenomena uh, there is an uh, space yes. the vacuum gas is there inside the vertebral body that means patient will not heal in those cases as a pain relief pressure we can inject a cement either just a cement or a balloon kyphoplasty can be done but i will cover the miscellaneous fracture topic separately sir so uh, osteoporotic fractures kyphoplasty and plan break as a separate class well, probably yes, when sir. there is a when there is a traumatic burst fracture probably yes, there may be a leak of the bone cement into the spinal cord which will produce some other damage or something yes like sir something. yes sir yes i am not sure about it yes sir i will i will i am a separate class and i will explain it in that class sir. okay thank you thank you sir thank you sir. thank you for joining sir. there are some uh, sir kartik do you have any doubts uh, yes sir uh, thank you sir thank you for the presentation sir Sir, uh, one thing uh, regarding that uh, classification in uh, Baccaro staging, you said uh, complete cord paralysis. You give uh, two scores. Two points. Right? Yes. Cord I equal I will give three. Yes. So what I am asking is, is it only depending upon the vertebral level? Because both will have anyway the deficits. So definitely. Now we, definitely. For example, if there is an L3 vertebral body compression fracture with the bladder bone involvement. Okay. Yes. Yes. But the patient is having some sort of ankle movement is there. No, call it as you call it as cord iphone syndrome. There is a bladder bone involvement. So you give maximum points to that. Okay. If it is a cord level, if it is an incomplete cord injury, you give maximum points to it. Okay. 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 If it is a complete cord injury, you give two points. Okay. Uh, sir, uh, one more thing is that uh, you. Uh, said about uh, that uh, sacral sparring and spinal shock. Yes. In both of the things, we are checking the bulbo cavernous reflex. Yes. So, uh, if the bulbo cavernous bulbo cavernous if the if the bulbo cavernous reflex is absent. Yes. Okay, that means the patient is in spinal shock. Uh, so, like when the patient presents to us, like so, we can't uh, say whether it is a uh, like. A, no the patient is not having sacral sparring or he is in spinal yes, cord exactly 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 so if the for example when the patient is coming to you you want to know whether the patient is having uh, the patient is in spinal shock or not you first assess the bulbo cavernous reflex okay the bulbo cavernous reflex is present that means patient is out of spinal shock okay or if the patient is presenting after two days of injury Okay. That means also automatically patient is out of spinal shock. So okay. only when the patient is out of spinal shock, the true nature of the neurological injury can be assessed. Okay. Is it clear? We, we have a time duration for that, sir. Like any. Yes. Usually when the when the the, the spinal shock will last, it's variable. Usually it it will the patient will be out of spinal shock by thirty six hours to forty eight hours. Okay. Sir. Uh, Sir, so one more thing is like uh, you said, uh, like we will do posterior instrumented fixation. So yes. uh, depending on the type of the fracture uh, uh, morphology, like you said, uh, if it is a compression fracture, like should we give a distraction after putting the rods? And in flexion distraction injury, should we give a compression? Anything like that, or no. only we? No. For, for example, so if there is a compression fracture, 
the compression of the screws, distraction of the screws is one method of correcting the deformity. What I do is, if the patient is having a fracture at the thoracolumbar junction, so what is the curvature of the spine at the thoracolumbar junction? It is almost straight. Right. Okay, put a straight rod. Okay. If the patient is having fracture at the T8 level, what is the curvature of the spine? It is a 20 to 30 degree kyphosis. You give 20 to 30 degree kyphosis to the rod. If it is a fracture at the lumbar spine, you give a lot of this to the rod. Just try to push in the rod to the screw. A distraction, compression, maneuver will occur by itself. You need not do separately. Okay. 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 Uh, sir, uh, one more question is uh, regarding that uh, tuberculosis topic, sir. Actually, I read it. Okay. So, uh, I like I got confused when it comes to the surgical part. Like, like when to do only posterior fix, uh, like posterior stabilization. Like when to do anterior reconstruction and when to do middle column decompression. Like. There, are, there has been like many things like this. So, in, if at all the case comes in exam, when we should go for anterior reconstruction, when to say only just posterior stabilization and when to do decompression. Like, so, like, See, is there any criteria? Oh, oh, this is our, this is a tuberculosis spine. So, what if the patient is having tuberculosis spine? So, there are certain criteria for surgery. So, when the patient is not, the, the pain is persisting, when the patient is having neurological deficit, then there is kyphosis. Then you have to do for surgery. Okay. Okay. So in the uh, if the patient is having neurological deficit because of any abscess or granulation tissue, you stabilize it, you do a laminectomy, and you decompress it. Okay. 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 Yes. Okay. okay. If the if the if the compression is from the anterior aspect, okay, okay. anterior aspect to the cord, there is a pus. Then what I told. You can do a transpedicular approach. You go to the anterior part of the cord, remove all the uh, debris, come out. After the removal, if you are seeing a big vacuum there, big space is there, then you put some bone graft or a cage. If there is not big vacuum is there, only limited space is there, just do posterior stabilization, come out and fuse by itself. Okay. Am I clear? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. If, if in case you are going for correction of the kyphosis, then anterior reconstruction is a must. Okay. Why the kyphosis occurs? Because the anterior structure has collapsed. So there is a kyphosis. So anterior reconstruction is a must for correction of the kyphosis. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So there are other questions in the chat section. Sir, uh, can you elaborate on cantilever effect? So what is cantilever effect? We'll just go to the slide, previous slide. So this is the cantilever effect. What happens? So this is the fracture vertebra. You have put a screw above and below. Okay. Whenever the axial load is given, this anterior part, this anterior part is not supporting the axial load. Okay, this is not supporting the axial load, so it collapses anteriorly and there is a failure of the screw system. So this is called as cantilever effect. There is an axial load. This axial load should be uh, compromised, this should be uh, stabilized by this pedicle screws. So this pedicle screws is not able to support the axial load, it fails. So this mechanism is called as cantilever effect. Okay. So by just by adding a pedicle screw in the fracture vertebra, this cantilever effect will not uh, occur. This axial load will be shared between these three screws and it can share the load. So this is that is called as uh, cantilever effect. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Then comes uh, role of vertebroplasty in stable fractures. Motilal's question. So I'm, I will, I will uh, in cervical spine injury topic, I will add this topic of vertebral plasty and kyphoplasty. Other question is, conservatively treated compression fracture present with late onset pain, what should do? So there is a stable compression fracture. You are treating conservatively with propolumbar phase. Patient is improving, but late onset pain. So what are the reasons for late onset pain? One, the patient is having persistent osteoporosis. One thing. If you are not correcting osteoporosis adequately, then patient will have persistent pain. 
second if the fracture has not healed okay so usually when the, when you are treating a patient conservatively when the patient comes for follow up always take a lateral standing view standing view is must don't take a lying down view lying down view will not give you a clue whether the fracture is collapsing or not when you take a standing view and compare with the initial x ray you can find whether the fracture is healing or it is collapsing one way or if you are in doubt you can get a flexion extension view when you get a flexion extension view when the body is fully united there won't be any problem if the body is not fully united as i said earlier there is a vacuum phenomena it can occur in both fracture and compression fractures then there is a non human of the vertebral body then you have to intervene surgically okay so kalayarsan has raised the question what to do with late onset pain in conservative patients so treat the osteoporosis make sure that the fracture is united by taking a lateral standing view or flexion extension view if it is united start the fracture on back strengthening exercises so all these things will help okay that is there any other questions happy to answer so if there is no other questions uh, we will uh, come to the end of the session uh, thank you for joining me uh, next class i will announce you later the next class will be on cervical spine fractures and in the cervical spine fractures i will cover topic on uh, spinal rehabilitation and uh, role of steroids in spinal cord injury and this vertebral plastic and kyphoplasty thank you thank you everybody Thank you sir. Thank you. Thank you.